Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Zornitsa and I'm the moderator of this online session on behalf of the school selection platform Unimai. In today's webinar, you will learn more about the MBA program at the Queen's Management School at Queen's University Belfast. More specifically, you will explore the social innovation and business planning module, which aims to help students better understand the concept of sustainability and apply its principles in practice. A few words about the school and the program. Queen's University Belfast is one of the oldest universities in the United Kingdom and forms part of the elite Russell Group known as UK's Ivy League. Its MBA is Equis and AMBA accredited uh, intensive career development program which focuses on entrepreneurship, business analytics and business ethics in an international environment. If you'd like to learn more, I would like right now paste in the chat the official web page of the Queen's full-time MBA, as well as the school's profile on Unimai, where you can do a quick test and see how well the Queen's MBA matches your preferences. Let us now welcome our panelists on behalf of the Queen's Management School, Stephen Armstrong, MBA Administrator, and Dr. Bernadette Best, Lecturer in Management. We will start with a brief overview of the Queen's Belfast MBA, its advantages and admissions requirements. Then Dr. Best will explain what social innovation and business planning has to do with your business and what you will learn in the specific module as a part of the Queen's Belfast MBA. If you have any questions, please write them down in the chat box or the Q&A option anytime during the webinar, and we'll take the time to address them at the end of the session. Now, I would like to give the word to Stephen to present himself and the Queen's Belfast MBA. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zori, for that uh, warm introduction and, and welcome everyone to this webinar, which is um, introducing the MBA program at Queen's Management School um, from the great city of Belfast. Uh, my name, as you can probably see, is Stephen Armstrong. I'm the MBA administrator at the course. So I'm going to give you uh, just a brief um, overview, uh, a bit of a flavor of uh, our MBA program. Um, and highlight a few of the, the kind of key um, bits of information that you probably want to know um, when you're choosing your, your MBA pathway. Um, and then I'll hand over to um, uh, Dr. Bernadette Best, who's going to talk to you about the social innovation and business planning module that's a, a, a very exciting part um, of our MBA program at Queen's. So I'm just going to um, share my screen with you. I've got a short presentation and I will keep it short, I promise. Um, and I'll take a few minutes just to um, introduce the, the program for you. Um, so let me see. Uh, guys, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we can see them. Great, perfect. So um, I believe Zori has already mentioned that uh, Queen's is a, a, it's a historic university, a beautiful red brick campus. Um, it's actually the ninth oldest in the, the United Kingdom. And uh, as Zori also mentioned, we're a member, a proud member of the Russell Group, which is the 24 um, research intensive universities. It's uh, often referred to as the UK's Ivy League. Um, we're very lucky that uh, our management school, Queen's Management School, is located in uh, another stunning uh, heritage building, uh, Riddle Hall. Um, it's a, a, a genuinely beautiful campus and it's a, a great uh, home for our management school. It's also undergoing um, a, a very large um, expansion because our student numbers are, are, are growing at a, uh, at a rapid rate and we are currently adding another um, very large impressive building to the campus you can see here in the, in the pictures. 
Uh, Zori also mentioned our accreditation. Um, we are very pleased to announce that we are accredited by AMBA. So our MBA program specifically um, is accredited by the Association of MBAs. Um, this is a very prestigious um, accreditation, which is capped at uh, 300 um, MBA programs worldwide. They are only accrediting um, 300 programs worldwide, and we're very proud that our MBA has been included in that uh, exclusive group. And our management school, our business school is Equus accredited. Um, this is another very prestigious, very sought after accreditation. Um, we are one of, of just under 200 business schools worldwide that have achieved this accreditation. And that places us in, uh, within the top 1% of, of business schools worldwide. Um, we're also uh, a, a very highly ranked um, uh, university and very highly ranked for business and economics. You can see here uh, a cutaway from uh, the Times World University Rankings. This one's a little bit old, 2020, um, but we're a, a top 200 um, university and, and within the, the top 200 for business economics as well. So that's a little bit about the, um, the school and its uh, history and its status within um, rankings and, and accreditations. And you can read more about that on our website and, and also within our, our Unimai profile. I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of our MBA as well. So our MBA essentially, um, we talk about it in, in terms of, of, of three kind of broad um, strains or, 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 or a kind of three-pronged approach. Um, the first of those you can see is uh, leadership skills development. That's very much um, focused on developing you as an individual and your uh, the leadership skills within you. And we're very lucky that uh, attached to our management school, we have a world-class executive education center, the William J. Clinton Leadership Institute. So our MBA students get to work on a one-to-one -one basis with executive education professionals to develop the leadership capability uh, within themselves. So um, in addition to your subject knowledge and everything else you'll learn within the, the MBA from your uh, professors and, and peers, um, you'll also get to work with these executive education specialists to develop you as, as a potential leader. The next point um, or the next prong of the three is the, the general kind of module coverage. And, and here you'll see um, a lot of uh, familiar uh, kind of core business um, concepts, the core functions within a business and how they fit together. So you've got things like accounting, marketing, finance, operations, etc. cetera. Um, but also um, we are looking into kind of uh, emerging um, themes and, and emerging subjects. So included within our program structure, uh, among the electives, you'll see things like social innovation that uh, Bernie will talk to you about in uh, a bit more detail later. And um, also business analytics. We're all aware of the big data explosion, uh, the number of, of job opportunities and, and career opportunities, business opportunities that exist um, within data science. Uh, so those have been included in, uh, or incorporated into our MBA structure as well. And the third part of the third prong of the three is business engagement. Um, engagement with uh, real world business organizations um, is a huge part of ours and, and um, any uh, MBA. This happens on a variety of levels in lots of different ways from very simple ways, having guest speakers come into the class, having site visits to company HQs to much more involved um, and in-depth ways. Things like our student challenges where students will work with a client organization to um, define and find a solution to a particular business problem or to come up with a, a, a service or a, a product to meet a, a particular uh, consumer need. So these are much more um, in-depth, much more engaged and allow students to really bring to bear everything that they've learned within their MBA program. And this all culminates in our MBA project 
which essentially takes the place of uh, traditional dissertation. Um, it's a three into four month um, project at the end of your MBA. And again, you'll have the option to work with a real life client organization in a consulting role, or instead, if you've got uh, a more entrepreneurial mindset, you can, you can develop a business plan, or you can do a deep dive um, research into um, a, a, a larger established company and, and, and analyze their um, published data. So there are a lot, a lot of different options there for you um, within the MBA to kind of develop um, your own areas of interest and areas of specialization. So that's just a very, very quick uh, whistle top, stop tour of uh, the MBA and its structure. All of this begins with our launch week, which is our opportunity to get our students out of the classroom, out of their comfort zone, into some of Northern Ireland's uh, award-winning natural beauty, um, form teams, um, learn about themselves and their fellow students, and, and build those relationships that will be the building blocks um, upon which you develop as an MBA student uh, across the, the, the year of your MBA at Queen's. I mentioned our student challenges. Um, there's a picture here of some of our students at um, the Science Park at Catalyst um, working on their entrepreneurship challenge. This is um, a, a way for them to engage in um, a very creative way um, where they're able to work with their um, their, their groups, their, their um, group members uh, to create a, a product or a service or an app or something um, that is unique to them. Our program uh, is very much uh, Belfast based and Northern Ireland based, but included within the structure, we also like to give our students some international experience. So as well as all of the engagement with the, the local business environment and local businesses, we also um, send our students on an international study tour. Um, previously, our students have gone to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley. They've um, engaged with the likes of Netflix and Shell and Oracle. Um, so this is an opportunity to experience um, a, a different um, business environment, one that they're perhaps unfamiliar with, and to get a, a, an international perspective um, in, within their MBA. Uh, Zori, I think, mentioned earlier that there's a, a, a large kind of emphasis on entrepreneurship within our MBA. You may have I heard we mentioned that once or twice as well. Um, this is one of our students who uh, won a, a very prestigious award with the Santander Bank um, and was uh, given sponsorship to develop her own company um, on the, the back of a business plan she developed within her MBA. This is something we um, are able to do for our MBA students. We can also sponsor them for a startup visa, uh, which enables them to remain in the UK and start their, their business in the UK post-graduation. Um, so just a couple of quick notes on entry requirements. Uh, we don't require GMAT or GRE or any other standard test except for English language, uh, which should be IELTS 6.5 or equivalent. Um, in addition to that, we're looking for uh, a strong honours degree, um, which should be equivalent to a UK 2.1 honours. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. You can find um, reference points on our website or simply submit your application and our admissions team will work out the um, the equivalents for you, um, as well as uh, work experience. Normally, we're looking for a minimum of five years post-graduation work experience. Ours is a, a one-year post-experience MBA. So normally, we're expecting students to arrive with their specialist knowledge already developed, and we build upon that the, the generalist uh, knowledge that's needed to take them into the next stage of their careers. So um, we're typically looking for um, five years post-graduation work experience. However, each application is uh, considered um, holistically uh, on its own merits. So if you don't have the um, uh, formal qualification, the academic qualification, or your work experience is a little bit less than the five years, but you're able to demonstrate um, 
uh, that you have um, achieved uh, experiential learning equivalent to either of those within your application, then you will certainly be given consideration um, for, for the MBA at Queen's. So we would certainly encourage um, students who feel they may be on the borderline to submit an, uh, an application. It's, it's free to do so. It doesn't take you very long to complete. And um, we'll, we'll certainly give that um, full consideration. In terms of fees and funding, the fees for the next academic year are £26,250. That includes the study tour, um, the flights and accommodation expenses are all included in that um, tuition fee. We also have MBA-specific scholarships available. Um, you can see the amounts here. There's up to, uh, three scholarships of up to £5,000, four of £2,500, and five at £1,000. To be elig eligible for the scholarships, all you need is to have completed the application process. By that, I mean accepted an offer um, by the end of June, and then you will be um, invited to apply for the scholarships. So very, very quick um, run through a few uh, highlights. So we're um, a top 200 um, ranked AMBA and Equus accredited MBA. It's a one year intensive program. You have the uh, opportunity to study in a, in a leading UK city um, with an excellent campus and um, not only our, our management school, but also world class uh, graduate school as well. An international study experience included within the MBA, um, scholarship opportunities specific to um, MBA students, um, regular opportunities to engage with um, local and international businesses, uh, career development. Um, with our executive education team at the, the Clinton Leadership Institute. Um, the option to join or the, 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 the um, chance to join a huge global alumni network and um, all of that wrapped up with very competitive um, tuition fees and uh, Belfast and uh, Northern Ireland's low cost of living relative to uh, other major cities in the UK. So um, very quickly then, because um, I'm aware of the time, um, we have a, an alumni network of, of, of over uh, 200,000 um, uh, alumni worldwide. Um, you'll see from the diagram here that um, it's a, a very, very widespread global network of, of Queen's alumni. And We've got a few little quotes here from um, some of our former MBA students. I'll just run through these and you'll be able to see them on the recording because I don't want to eat too much into the, the time we have for um, uh, Bernie's presentation. And um, if you have any questions, um, you can add them to the chat and we've got a bit of time set aside for Q&A at the end. But with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Bern, Dr. Bernadette Best, um, who will talk to you about social innovation and business planning. Let me just stop sharing there. Oh, I stopped. There we go. Okay, Stephen, thank you very much for that and to you as well. Sorry. Um, can everyone see my presentation okay? Do yes, to... yes, I can see it. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so today, as Stephen mentioned, we're going to talk about social innovation and business planning, really to give you an overview of what's involved in that module and why you as potential leaders of industry maybe need to give some consideration to the importance of social innovation in the interests of helping your business to grow and to become more sustainable. So I thought I would start by giving you a little bit of context around social innovation, why it's important, you know, why it's becoming more central to the way that leaders, particularly of large corporate organizations, do business. Um, and then want to touch on what you will learn and um, how you will go about learning some of the material and some of the interesting case studies that we have underpinning this particular module. And then very importantly, I think 
you know, we take a lot of pride in what we do within the management school around engaging learners in the process of learning. In particular, drawn on what Stephen said there about the, the criteria for selection, where we're looking to recruit people who have some industrial or practitioner based experience um, and who have accrued that over a number of years. So the important thing is about sharing that expertise, that knowledge, and being able to critically discuss some of the kind of theoretical and practitioner frameworks that enable social innovation to happen. And finally, I'd like to end by touching on some of the fantastic insights and some of the great lessons that we have learned from the International Study Tour and some of the organizations that Stephen has alluded to. So I suppose, you know, I like to present uh, students with a number of questions really to raise some debate and some discussion about social innovation. And at the heart of the module is, you know, why does it matter? Or in fact, does it matter to contemporary businesses in today's society? Is it, you know, are those businesses fundamentally only concerned about making profit and indeed profit at any cost? Or is there something there about, you know, doing good for society and making a difference to the role, the remit and the expectations that different shareholders on the one hand, but also wider stakeholders have um, to really elevate the notion of value co-creation and to give back something to society by way of helping the environment, helping social causes, whilst at the same time creating and carving opportunities to capitalize from that in the business sense. So those are some of the fundamental questions that we have a good old debate around. When we look at some of these kind of images here, you may well ask, do social or environmental issues actually impact on the kind of business or the kind of sector that either you have worked for or, or aspire to work in in the future? So do these kind of issues really matter? Um, and what we see is a growing number in society today of multinational corporations and others from different public, private and nonprofit sectors turning to corporate social innovation as a means and as a strategy to help address issues such as what we see here, issues to do with slow economic growth, issues to do with the kind of increasing wealth gap that exists in society today, issues such as climate change, such as global warming, warming such as high levels of unemployment, uh, disparities around children's youth and education, and also the growing concerns and the kind of significant economic, social and environmental costs that are associated with the COVID-19 pandemic that you know, are going to create problems for not only developing nations, but also for emerging countries. So why the push then for social innovation? Does it really matter? Is it likely to make a difference in the kind of contemporary business situations that leaders find themselves in today, irrespective of the sector that they operate within? And I think we can share and take a few lessons around what others have said, other leading lights of industry, for example, the previous chairman of Nestle talks about the interdependencies between business survival today and the need to understand uh, the wider environment in which society and business operates. So he quotes that really it is society that gives business the license to operate. And a leader does need to therefore be involved in thinking about and attempting to kind of resolve some of the wider wicked social problems that um, are crippling to some extent businesses today. And also at the same time, affording new opportunities for new and innovative solutions to tackle some of these problems. We've got then the World Economic Forum who 
talks about and reflects on the importance that young people have when it comes to making decisions about who they want to work with. And quite often that is about, you know, working with companies who have a sense of purpose. And also brands for that matter, that have an ability to kind of survive in the longer term by being purposeful brands or value-led brands. And then we have, you know, increasingly sustainable development goals, which are making large corporations stand up and pay attention to how they do business, to the, the contributions that they're able to make to social, environmental and economic goals in a kind of more sustainable way and in a way that enables them to benefit from um, competitive advantage. So those are a few of the reasons why there's a greater push for this corporate social innovation strategy and agenda. So how does that work? And um, we know that there is this growing importance on um, corporate purpose. And what we can do is learn from the experience and the insights from some of the Fortune 500 CEOs. And what we, um, a, a recent McKenzie study tells us that less than 7% of those CEOs of the Fortune 500 com companies actually feel that their business should mainly and only focus on making profits and shouldn't be distracted by the idea of social goals. So that means 93% of CEOs of those companies see it as being something of relevance and something of importance moving forward. I suppose when we talk about purposeful leadership, we're looking at a mark, which states that that begins with each individual who works within a company. And it begins by looking at those people as being leaders of their own area of work in their own right. It also looks about harnessing the collective input and collaboration from teams, from the organization, and from the organization's interface with and contribution to the goals of wider society. So it's about joining up those kind of critical dimensions to enable the purpose and the value of the organization to be communicated in a more robust and in a more holistic manner. So we can learn from some of the organizations who I have to say, to some extent, have got the agenda right when it comes to corporate and social innovation, but have also made mistakes in that regard along the way. So some of these big corporate organizations are reflected in the slide. And indeed, we have a number of case studies woven into the social innovation mod module to help us understand you know, where things have gone right and where things have gone wrong with regard to a number of these companies. Companies like IBM, like Google, like Nestle, um, particularly Nestle's shared value agenda, um, which has been prompted and inspired by the work of a couple of scholars called Porter and Kramer. And uh, we certainly delve into um, their work and have critical discussion and debate about that. But the transition, what we see over the last 30 years is a lot of companies who have tried to do good, if you like, for society by making investments in philanthropic giving, if you like, giving to charities or, you know, helping staff to become volunteers of good causes um, through, that will enhance their teamwork and their motivation. And a transition away from that into strategic investments where organizations increasingly have started to look at new ventures and started to invest more in social enterprises that really help them to make um, a difference when it comes to their social impact um, as well as their financial impact. And that has transisted, if you like, into a more systemic level of investment where companies are now attempting to address some of the wider systemic social problems, the wicked problems, if you like, that are impacting their business today. 
and will continue to impact their business moving forward unless and until they actually engage in collaborative actions and sharing resources and leveraging knowledge from other wider players in the wider environment, including those who are in the same industry as them or people in other sectors as well. So it's only by addressing some of the social problems and some of the environmental issues that really business stands um, to gain, if you like, for themselves and for others in wider society. So this thing called corporate and social innovation requires really a mindset change and um, a change of attitudes. And attitudes whereby CEOs and leaders of these organizations begin to recognize that there are interdependencies between you know, business and how it intends to operate to make profit while simultaneously you know, understanding that it is society that gives it a license to operate and therefore understanding and meeting the expectations and the requirements of stakeholders over time that have views and that can maybe potentially do harm to the way that business operates becomes really important. What we talk a lot about within the module is looking at things like how do businesses become sustainable by re-engineering or reconfiguring their business models with a view to doing one important thing, and that is to continue to co-create social, economic, and environmental value. And value for the business themselves is really important, but also how they can do that in a way that's much more open and much more collaborative. We then look at creating solutions to some of the the kind of complex social issues that permeate the wider environment today. And through looking at those in a very dynamic way, in a way that kind of lends itself to um, design thinking, which is integral to this module, businesses are able to identify and come up with new value propositions for their customers. And in so doing, become more profitable in themselves. So we look at co-creation of value through collaborative or more relational approaches to tackling these wicked problems. And a large part of the module and part of my research uh, interests and areas are around how value is co-created in a collaborative network kind of context. So part of what I do around my module is to disseminate and share my research, published research, in this field uh, with students. Co-creating new business opportunities that contribute to societal value often requires design thinking. And we get to grips with some of the practicalities. And I give you lots of examples of different approaches and methodologies behind design thinking used by companies in Northern Ireland, but also organizations further afield. We also um, introduce guest speakers who have been forerunners and pioneers of design thinking so that you can learn and share from their experience of its use and practice. We, a large part of the module is focused on what's called open innovation. And we compare and contrast how that difference differs to closed innovation and how some of the large multinational corporate organizations have switched or transitioned, if you like, to open innovation as a means of enabling them to benefit from the knowledge and the expertise of people who know something about their business, but actually aren't employed by their business. So not all of the smart people necessarily work for Google or Microsoft, for example. And these leaders of those kind of organizations have learned that along the way and learned to use open innovation platforms as a means of actually coming up with new ideas for new and exciting things to happen. We look at measuring impact. So, you know, I suppose on the one hand, making a difference to society 
and making a contribution to the environment it becomes important goals when it comes to a company's contribution to sustainable development. But then there comes the added complexities of how you actually measure that kind of contribution that you're making and how you report on it as well. So there's loads of opportunities to learn from how businesses have actually done that and shared their impact reports. And we then take a look at what's called the quadruple helix effect. And this is my attempt to showcase that in this slide, where I suppose research has moved from looking at the quadruple helix effect to a quintuple helix effect, where there's much more engagement between industry, academia, government, um, civic society, and indeed increasingly the environmental uh, platforms and organizations that one can learn from by engaging in collaborative mechanisms and platforms to really understand how businesses by coming together can co-create value that is wider than the single purpose of the organization. So it's about learning platforms and co-engagement platforms and bringing key figures and uh, experts together to learn from each other and to disseminate knowledge. So I now want to touch on what you will learn and how you will learn. So the module is covered over a four week period and it's a mixture of both um, lectures but also a number of tutorial sessions. And the tutorial sessions in particular help students to engage with debates and conversations around the social innovation literature and also their experience and expertise of using or embracing social innovation in their practice. In week one, we examine what is social innovation from a theory and a practice perspective. We begin the debate and the conversation around what is the business of business nowadays and why does social innovation matter? We discuss the concepts then of social and economic um, and indeed for that matter the environmental case for social innovation and why it's important to invest in that. And then we uh, conclude by exploring some of the concepts of open and closed innovation. In week two, it's very much um, an examination and exploration of some of the sources of social innovation. And I would then introduce the concept of business model innovation. So we begin to evaluate different perspectives on Porter and Kramer's notion of shared value. And whilst many scholars have you know, published lots of articles on that very concept, there's also been a lot of critical debate and discussion about you know, whether shared value really is the way to go and really does make a difference to, um, to the economic, the environmental and the uh, sustainability agenda of business today. We then look to how organisations begin to co-create value by re-engineering their business models to come up with new value propositions that will make a difference to customers and how those value propositions are created. We explore key dimensions of the business model framework and we draw on Oster Waddle's business model canvas to do that. And part and partial of the, the module is to invite key guest speakers or experts from industry to share and disseminate lessons learned from their expertise in this field of social innovation. And what I like to do, an important part of the module, is helping students to really understand the assessment requirements and the criteria which your performance is going to be measured on. So I do spend time and cover different assessment workshops to help them understand that. And week three, it's about um, looking at social innovation, very importantly, in a network context. So not so much what a single organization needs to do to commit the, to this kind of agenda, but rather how organizations are increasingly using network platforms and looking at network collaboration 
within and across different sectors to actually co-create value through social innovation. So we look at examining the challenges and the benefits of value co-creation and um, using different types and sharing different types of business models and using applied case studies. We then analyze why net networks are becoming more and more increasingly the new modality of choice for value demonstration. We examine how social innovation is led and enabled, particularly in a Northern Ireland context, simply because I have a key guest speaker who works for um, an organization who has invested lots of years of pioneering work in the field of social innovation. And a key part then of that component of week three is getting the students out to visit a local um, award-winning organization who has a highly acclaimed reputation for demonstrating social innovation through a community regeneration project in a very profound and a very dynamic way and indeed a very sustainable way. So you have an opportunity then to have a presentation from the CEO of an organization in Belfast called Skenos and learn from you know, what they have done in practice to make uh, an award-winning building, a new building for that matter, um, fit for purpose and you know, how it's able to reach out and embrace the needs of employers and of other community-based organizations in the local community that they serve. Okay, so that's just a little picture of the Skenos building. Um, which actually has um, a vertical garden. It's one of the few uh, buildings in Northern Ireland with that. Then in week four, we bring it to a conclusion by looking at how social innovation is led and some of the lessons around leading social innovation to co-create value. And we draw on the work of uh, companies such as Coca-Cola, of Bryson Recycling in Northern Ireland, and of other case studies of organizations, which I'll touch on in a moment or two, to learn about ethical risks um, and opportunities as a consequence of their engagement and investment in this particular concept. So one of the case studies that we look at, for example, and this would be typical of an exercise that students are engaged in, um, I would give students out a very short case study of the work of say four organizations here, Merck and Company, Microfinance by the Branding Bank, Fair Trade by Max Havler and uh, Nestle and their marketing of the baby milk formula in Africa. And then I would ask students to um, talk about the case studies and to work in groups to populate a template which is about exploring and identifying the goals and um, how ethical and risk considerations were addressed by each of the four companies and what were the kind of key lessons learned as a consequence of that. So they begin to compare and contrast what worked, why it worked and what didn't work and what were the lessons learned from that. So a lot of how you learn is certainly by formative and summative feedback and engagement exercises. So we have lots of case studies woven in to the module itself. There is a study visit, both an international one and a Northern Ireland study visit as well. Um, there's lots of sharing of uh, contemporary research, particularly around social innovation, value co-creation and business model innovation. Uh, there will be inputs from key guest speakers, including program leaders of the Building Change Trust, the CEO of the Skenos um, Regeneration Project, and also an input from a leader of the local social innovation organization. We do lots of reviews and critical discussions on journal articles. There will be a number of assessment workshops to help you understand the criteria for the assessment components, which I'll talk about in a moment or two. 
Um, there's lots of ongoing coursework assessments and tasks, short tasks and activities that you will be asked to think about and do some work behind in between uh, weeks one, two, three and four. Um, and there will be ongoing de debates and discussions and problem solving opportunities and inquiry based learning. So some of the case studies of the organisations that we will endeavour to discuss and debate are um, reflected really in the slide here. Coca-Cola, Bryson, Nestle, Starbucks, uh, Nespresso, um, AMH Works, Procter & Gamble, Lego, to name but a few. And then we have other organisations that are woven into the module itself where you will hear through webinars, through videos, through, um, through other kind of um, case studies of what organisations have done to raise their profile and to commit to social innovation and the kind of differences that social innovation is making to their bottom line and to their contribution to wider society. So just to touch briefly on the assessment components, there are two aspects to the assessment for this module. 100% of the module is assessed through coursework, so there's no examination involved in that. Uh, the first assignment is um, an individual essay with a reflective piece, and uh, that's weighted at 40% of the overall assessment for the module and it accounts for a 1500 word assignment. There's another then individual assignment which is weighted at 60% and that slightly longer piece of work and that includes 2500 words of an individual assignment and you're given details of those assignment components right from the start of week one. The assignment feedback, um, normally what I like to do is turn that around very quickly for students because you're always very keen to get feedback on your performance within the module. So within two weeks of the submission deadline and lots of assessment guidelines are made available to, student, to students rather through the module handbook and through the assessment workshops. Probably one of the highlights and um, one of your areas of interest for not only doing the module, but also committing to an MBA program is the International Study Tour. It is a simply fantastic experience for students. Um, two years ago, I, Stephen mentioned about the Silicon Valley experience, and I had the privilege of going with another lecture and a bunch of the MBA students, you can see it's here in the slide, going to Netflix. And we had a simply fabulous opportunity to learn from other experts in organizations such as Shell, Oracle, Colgate, Palmolive, uh, Netflix, um, Holt International Business School, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Kiva. Um, and we had an opportunity to ask questions of those leaders. Um, so fabulous insights, fabulous opportunities to share knowledge. And we also had some social events as well, where we all went off to the Napa Valley and were able to feel a picnic and some wine tasting. And we had a guided tour of San Francisco to see the wealthier parts of what the um, state had to offer, as well as some of the challenges around homelessness, for example. So some of the key lessons, I touch on these just very, very briefly because we're going to run out of time, unfortunately. But what we learned from that experience and from the experts there is that Silicon Valley is not a destination. It's not a location. It's actually about a mindset. And that mindset is very much about understanding the possibilities for business do and can happen. And that, you know, a mindset is about having entrepreneurial opportunities to make the impossible possible. Some of the key kind of things that underpin the lessons learned from that international study tour are what I've reflected here in the slide 
I won't unfortunately get time to cover some of the lessons learned in each of these things, but it gives you a flavor, I think a very good flavor of how these kind of thematic insights are underpinned in the social and facial module. So we had lessons there from experts that said, leading change in the order of things as part of this mindset change of people who work in Silicon Valley. In other words, they're pioneers of change. They're not afraid to take risks. They actually feel that part and partial of learning how business works is about making mistakes and actually learning from failure moving forward. And I think that's very refreshing for people, perhaps more so in the UK, who are a bit more risk adverse. Part of it's about learning how to reconfigure your business model to make sure that you're demonstrating added value in a, a timely manner and in a manner that co-creates value for not just the business, but also for wider stakeholders. And part of it's about learning how to collaborate in, in and within an ecosystem. And part of it's about signing up investors, if you like, in business who have similar um, who have similar values to what's important in making your business work and who have um, a kind of regard for the triple bottom line for looking at the social, economic and environmental perspectives. So some of the things that we learn from these organizations about where the opportunities or possibilities lie for social innovation moving forward is the lasting effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that that kind of pandemic will continue to create new opportunities for business to come together and to co-create value by understanding and resolving some of the wicked problems that will continue to uh, permeate and make for difficulties for business moving forward. And the best and the, and the only way to tackle some of the effects of COVID-19 is to collaborate collectively and to work collaboratively. Other new opportunities include things like constant renewal of added value, um, particularly around new technologies and the kind of exciting platforms that technological innovations such as AI and virtual reality and machine learning have to offer businesses. Organizational transformation through data leveraging and through new data sources, particularly through open innovation platforms, is another uh, presents another opportunity. Things like telemedicine, things like homelessness, poverty, and COVID-19. How do we begin to address some of the growing problems that people who are part of the, the poverty gap or people who are impoverished and working and living in areas of social deprivation, how do we begin to tackle those issues and areas? How do we eliminate waste and particularly deal with the challenges around plastics and uh, single-use items that are easily disposed of? How do we tackle distance learning? Are there new opportunities there for staff to learn through those kind of distance learning platforms? And how do we manage risk through things that, are, that Oracle have been very proactive and engaging in, such as scenario modeling? So finally, just to conclude, these are some of the things that students who have previously engaged in the social innovation module have had to say over the period 1819, 1920 and 2021. So I'm not going to read these out. I'm going to leave them for you to ponder on, to think about if you like. Um, but students seem to have taken away a fair amount of insights and certainly have shared a lot about the module. So I leave it there and wish you all the best in your thinking about the MBA programme. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bernadette, for this wonderful presentation. Um, we have received two questions, and I think you already mentioned to answer them or at least partially answer them, but I will I'll go through them briefly just in case. 
So the first one, um, the need for of corporates uh, to drive social impact is crucial, but isn't the measuring of impact quite subjective and challenging? Uh, is measuring and reporting impact to investors and supporters covered in the course? I think you already confirmed the, the second bit, but would you please tell us a little bit more about it? I have to say measuring impact is incredibly problematic and difficult for business, mainly because there are a plethora of different frameworks that have been developed over a period of time to help um, leaders of industry begin to think about how to measure impact and how in particular to measure and capture the economic, the social and the environmental dimensions of that. But we can learn a lot from you know, what others in the field have done, particularly people like Nestle and Coca-Cola amongst two examples. Um, so Nestle, for example, and this is something we touch on within the social innovation module, have uh, taken forward the pioneering work of Porter and Kramer and have over a period of time been able to measure the difference that they have made and the contribution that they have made to social issues, to environmental issues and to their economic profitability, if you like, by coming up with a very holistic strategy in the first instance and uh, they very carefully communicated that strategy and broken the strategy down into certain um, key performance indicators where teams within Nestle are able to sign up to that agenda and to make a contribution to it. So that every person who works in Nestle is able through their um, personal development plan and through the kind of goals that are set for them and with them by their line manager to make a contribution to this very big strategy developed by the firm. The firm has been able to invest in different approaches and methodologies to help it measure its impact. It has certainly drawn on big data and um, on, uh, I suppose, investment in data systems to enable it to track and measure its performance over time in those three important quadrants. And then to pull that together in such a way as they're able to showcase that and to make a contribution back to government in terms of the difference they're making to sustainable development goals and then publish their performance on the website as well to help you and I understand better how they're actually making a difference in these different areas and domains. But it's a big machine, you know, that's needed. You can imagine the size of an organization like Nestle. They have people who are experts in measuring impact and in pulling reports together and in communicating uh, the impact and the difference that they're making. If you're a small business and you're trying to make inroads in that direction, that can be challenging because quite often you may not have the expertise, you may not have the resources to be able to do that at hand. And therefore, part of what we learn and exchange within the module is we learn from other experts um, who are willing to come into the social innovation module and share with students how they have done that and approached that difficult area of measuring impact through um, training and through um, you know, getting workshops together with people in local communities or entrepreneurs who maybe don't have an awful lot of staff to learn how to measure their impact. And there's loads of frameworks and resources available um, to help people to understand that. So, but it is an area that we do cover within the module, you're right in saying that. Yes, thank you, Bernadette. Yeah, and you also mentioned that there are plenty of case studies. And the last question is about the hands-on experiences during the, the, the module. Uh, the question was uh, specifically, is there a hands-on project or internship in a social enterprise or an NGO during the program? Uh, actually, I think you mentioned that uh, there are hands-on experiences during the study tours and a consultancy project. 
So maybe if you can tell us more about what kinds of organizations are included in this. Yeah, I don't know, Stephen, if that's something you want to touch on, the consultancy side. I'm very happy to share that, but I wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, Stephen, you're muted. Sorry. Um, yes, I mentioned um, in my kind of brief run through that the MBA culminates in a final project. It's the final kind of third of your um, MBA program. And one of the options is to undertake uh, a consultancy based project that will be working with a, a, a live client, uh, an organization um, to a, a certain extent of the students choosing. Obviously, there are a group of um, organizations that we work with on a regular basis, but students very much have a, a, an opportunity to influence um, the decision over who they will actually work with on, on their consulting project. And essentially, yes, there's an opportunity to work um, over an extended period of time with um, a real world organization to define a particular business problem. Usually it's something in the that um, is because the idea of it is to, to create, um, create uh, information that is of value to the organization, right? So it's usually something that's on the fringes of their um, awareness, something that perhaps they're aware of, um, maybe don't have the resource necessarily to deal with it right now, or they, do, they, they, they lack the resources of the, uh, the business school in terms of, of uh, doing the, the underlying research. And so this is a, a great opportunity for an MBA student to work with a client organization and to kind of delve into um, quite a meaty uh, uh, project with the client organization. And throughout the, the process, they'll have um, uh, an academic supervisor who will guide them on things like scope and making sure that it's kind of um, if they've got a project that's going to gel together because this is essentially their master's dissertation it, it takes uh, the place of a traditional dissertation um, but um, beyond that it's really the student working independently um, in that consulting role with the client organization um, great uh, thank you very much i think we're running out of time so i would just like to wrap up and to say uh, Stephen and bernadette thank you very much for this wonderful webinar I hope we have managed uh, to trigger the interest of our attendees into the field of uh, social innovation in general and more specifically into the Queen's Belfast MBA experience, which uh, as we, we uh, learned would give you the mindset and the skill set to become a socially responsible entrepreneur or even a social entrepreneur business leader on your own. So uh, thank you a lot, and I'm wishing to all the attendees uh, good luck in their academic and career development, and to Stephen and Bernadette, uh, I hope to see you soon.